Hey, welcome back to the Franchise Edge podcast brought to you by Scorpion. I'm your host, Jamie Adams. This week, really excited to bring this conversation to you with Justin Mink. Uh, Justin is an old friend. We talk about how long we've been friends on this podcast. Um, he also worked with me across two companies, including here at Scorpion, for a number of years as we um, built up a, a customer base in the franchise space. Justin is now a franchisee. Um, he is a franchisee of EOS, which is the Entrepreneurial Operating System. Many of you hopefully have read the book called Traction. Great book. If you hadn't picked it, if you hadn't read it, pick it up. Justin and I talk about um, how he got started in marketing way back in the day. Um, we talk about things that he learned um, as a supplier um, in in the franchise space, and then we talk about a lot about his life as a franchisee and how he works with brands and franchisees in implementing. EOS into their business. So um, really excited about this conversation. I think you're going to enjoy it. As a close friend of his, I'm super proud of the step that he took to go on, out on his own to become an entrepreneur, to buy a franchise. And I'm just thrilled to see how he's thriving in that space. So enjoy this conversation with Justin. And if you're interested in having a conversation with us at Scorpion, you can find us at scorpion.co. Um, and we look forward to talking with you soon. Take care. Hey man, so we're gonna start this conversation off with a key, with a key question. Yes. I want to know your opinion on something. Shoot. Okay. Tell me about reverse proxy. Uh, the really cool thing about reverse proxy is <laughs> conversion based optimization. Yes. Yes. Revolutionizing the game of digital marketing. Revolutionizing. Forever changing SMB marketing. Man, those are some good times. They were. They were they some were. good times. Every time I just hear Ben Pock. Shout out to Ben Pock. Yeah. The really cool thing about reverse proxy. <laughs> Conversion and conversion-based optimization was like yeah. the fallback for anybody who was terrible at selling. Uh -huh. Just go, uh, conversion-based optimization. <laughs> that was like a tick if you just didn't know how to pitch. <laughs> Man, there's just so many good times. So we've known each other a long time. <laughs> 20 plus years. Has it been that, it has been Dude, that long? 20 it's plus crazy, 2007. It? That's nuts. Almost 20 Almost years. 20 years. That's insane. Yeah. So we started working together at Reach Local. Before that, though, like let's I don't, I don't want to spend too much time back that far back. Okay. Right? But I do find it fascinating. I remember the first time I met you, you had been working at USA Today. You had just started, you started Reach like right before I did. Mm -hmm. But you had been selling for like USA Today. And then you also were doing like club promotions yeah. in the DC area. Yeah, I was a club promoter. Yeah. So, like, tell me just like favorite story from your club promoter days. Oh don't God. think too hard. Just the first one that comes to mind. Uh, Dave Chappelle met Dave Chappelle. No way. Yeah, he he's I, and I felt like an idiot because I, I was like the drunk, dumb young kid at the table with bottle service. Chappelle's chilling at the bar by himself. I'm like, Dave Chappelle, what are you doing here? And he goes, I'm from DC, man. I'm like, cool. <laughs> if you need anything, I'm the promoter. And he's like, awesome. Gotcha. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, That's met Martin Short at one of my club, no my way. parties. Uh, not Martin Short. Yeah, no, Martin. Martin Lawrence? Martin Lawrence, yeah, not Martin yeah, yeah. Short. Okay, De yeah. Whole different Martin. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> way different Martin, yeah. Bunch of celebrities would roll through. Yeah, I was I was like doing it big in D.C. for a few years in my late 20s. That's Throw, awesome. Throwing parties. Made more money doing that than my than working at USA Today. Wow. Um, but I was the zombie every Monday. Yeah, so, I yeah, bet. It was fun. I bet. It was oh, fun. That's a great story. <laughs> we spent a bunch of time together, a long time together at Reach Local. And then we spent a lot of time together at Scorpion. Um, you are not the... First Scorpion I've interviewed on the podcast. Right. I interviewed Tovin. Um, he and I had a conversation a couple of days ago. But you are the first Scor used to be Scorpion that is no longer a Scorpion on the podcast. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, always an alumni, though. Once You're, a Scorpion. Yeah, that's right. Always a Scorpion. That's right. So tell, tell me about, I, I do want to spend some time talking about marketing and things of that nature because yeah. you spend a lot of time there marketing and sales. But let's, you're a franchise now. You're I'm a, a franchisee. franchisee. Yeah. yeah. Of yeah. EOS. So, Tell, tell tell the audience about EOS and how did you kind of come about this opportunity? What what made you decide to, to pull the trigger on it? Yeah, so EOS is the Entrepreneurial Operating System. Most people who are familiar with it uh, have read the book Traction, Get yeah. a Grip, yeah, great book. which has sold over a million copies, yep. over 15 years old. So when I was at Scorpion, good friend of mine, Shanna Christen, yeah. Goldfish yeah. Swim uh -huh. Schools, yep. they still run EOS. It's just a simple set of practical tools designed to get leaders aligned on the vision of the company exactly where you're going, how you're going to get there together, create traction in the company so that there's discipline and accountability, all the human energy in the company's harness so that all those arrows are pointing in one direction, yep. making progress every day towards the achievement of vision and creating healthy teams that are open and honest with each other, no politics, no ego, because a lot of times leadership teams just aren't cohesive. Yeah. So yeah. as goes the leadership team, so goes the rest of the organization. Yeah. 
ultimately you end up with a company once you fully integrated these tools into the business. Everybody understands the vision. They believe in it. They want to be a part of it. Everybody's executing. Everyone understands what their accountability looks like and how it shows up. Yep. And you just got teams that enjoy being around each other and yep. kick ass at solving problems together. So uh, Shanna, I know Goldfish, they were a great client at Scorpion. Yeah. And um, phenomenal culture. Everybody was successful there. Franchisees killing it. She hands me a copy of the book Traction. And uh, I was really just compelled, like immediately, you know, simple, elegant framework. One of my favorite quotes of all time, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? It's very hard to make the complex simple. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that it was just practical tools that entrepreneurs and leaders could use, just put this framework in place and it frees you to be true, the, the, the best and truest version of yourself. Process is freedom, right? So uh, when I left Scorpion, I joined a little startup agency I kind of wanted to get back into an entrepreneurial type venture. Yeah, yeah. Scorpion was a rocket ship ride. By the time I left, pretty big company. Yeah. So I yeah. was ready to get back into kind of a startup world. And I joined under the condition that we run the business on EOS. Okay. So I sent the- You joined the new company on that Yeah. Condition. And no. it was actually a, a former client of ours at Reach Local. Oh, that's right. It was a multifamily deal. Yeah. 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 So a uh, friend of mine was a former client, became a friend over the years. And uh, it took us about six months. He- Love Traction too. Really six months to fully run the business on EOS. Live, eat, and breathe it really organically. And over that stretch, our revenue velocity almost doubled. We were selling media like over the top wow. TV and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, geofencing. Now, did you guys have an implementer there? No, no, we just did it You ourselves. just read the book and then just kind of decided we we're going to get on board with it? Yeah, okay. we were really disciplined about it. Okay. And then found out there was this thing called an EOS implementer teacher, facilitator, coach yep. of EOS. And then I found out that EOS had become a franchise a few years prior. Gino, the author of Traction, sold the company private equity. They turned into a franchise. And for me, that was like the universe. Like fr franchising is my tribe. It's my community. Yep. So the fact that I never imagined that I'd find anything that would be appealing enough to me, for me to be a franchisee. Yeah. So that was like, it was the easiest decision I ever made because I really believe in it. I lived it. And now it's really kind of professional calling to help other leaders experience what for me was really an up like freedom of from yeah. frustration, from stress, from chaos, and and really helping get what you want from the business with a sense of balance and control um, is kind of the ultimate freedom for an entrepreneur. So so it's uh, it's been a wonderful journey, man. It's That's fun. awesome. Yeah. yeah, it's been fun watching you yeah. watching you excel there too. What's it like though, going from you know, you, you, you were in several scenarios at Reach where, you know, like you said, we, we both joined very early on. So we saw, saw it from startup to kind of, you know, thousands of employees yeah. went public. Then you started another startup with some of the Reach guys. You were there for a bit. Then you came to Scorpion and we had a similar kind of trajectory, like very fast growing, um, turned into a big company. And now you're a, is it fair to call you a solopreneur? Yeah. Okay. So you're on your own, doing your own thing. What's that, what's that like mentally, emotionally? Like what, what are there big differences between that versus, you know, employee? Yeah. I think well, I know the answer, but I want to hear it from you. You know, it's, it's, it's actually, it's a good question. It's not. So when I was at Scorpion, primarily I had a few different roles there, but most of the time I spent there was reporting to you as an enterprise seller. Yeah. And what was wonderful about Scorpion was number one, the product was so strategic and so relational. Right. Yeah. And, and number two, um, the resources were unbelievable, right? Yeah. Scorpion believed in franchise and invested what was required for us to succeed. And number three, as long as production was there and I was always producing, it was like, yeah, I was running my show. Yeah, right. Right. And, right. and if I needed something, I'd ask and yeah. usually get it. Yeah. Um, so it really was like kind of a, it was almost like a, I wouldn't say entrepreneur, but very much producer. Yeah, right? I totally and like, get it. Yeah. And, and Scorpion, you know, you, you sales culture and you guys and the leadership, you, Rue, everybody there knows if you've got a producer who's producing, let yeah, them do their yeah, thing, right, right? right? Like don't get in their way yeah. and give them what they need to succeed. So it was almost like a natural transition. When I joined that other startup, I was in a leadership role and I had a, a number of epiphanies about what I, my zone of genius, right? What yeah. I love to do and I'm great at doing. and being accountable for people, being in the minutia, like execution is really not for me. Yeah. You yeah. know, and 
a lot of times in my past life as a leader, I kind of beat myself up for really not enjoying or being sure. really great at managing people. Yeah. I get frustrated easily. I'm impatient. Um, I didn't know that about you. Yeah. I expect people <laughs> to like live in my brain and yeah. immediately have some kind of like Vulcan mind meld. Yeah. And then, then they're like, Justin, how you, you actually told me mixed signals. And I'm like, well, yeah, but that's how I felt Tuesday. This is how I feel today. <laughs> Cause that's fair. Right. Um, so, so, you know, I, I realized that it's okay. And actually a lot of traction teaches about the visionary and integrator and how visionaries are idea people, forced to the trees, creative thinkers, and integrators are very much execution driven, like roll up your sleeves day to day managing the business. Yeah. And, and I'm a, I'm a textbook visionary. So being an EOS implementer, it's a little, it can be a little lonely sometimes when you're a solopreneur. Sure. But the nice part about EOS, we have a community of implementers, tons of support, very much values driven. So like-minded people that are cool, successful, smart, willing to help each other. And, uh, and, you know, I've had the opportunity to, uh, kind of flex my entrepreneurial muscles too, because I've created a whole franchise framework that didn't exist before yep. within EOS. So yeah, man, I really like, like I'm unemployable at this point. Yeah. You know, I, I can't see myself working for anybody or managing people. It's just, uh, you know, I like being a, and I like working with my clients, giving them my best, and then I can go home and sleep at night and I don't get so emotionally invested yeah. in the business, which no. I also had an issue with, like yeah. getting too attached. No, I get it, you I know? get it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny, man, because I remember having worked with you such a long time, I thought one of the things that you were always really good at though is like, you're a very self-aware guy. So like from my experience with you, like you knew inherently like where you where your sweet spots were what you were really really good at and you knew what your kryptonite was right. and you were pretty open and honest and vocal about like keep the kryptonite away from me mm -hmm. not trying to figure out a way to like get accustomed to the kryptonite <laughs> right so i think that one that's one thing that i've always really admired you about you like as a coworker and as a as a friend and a professional is some people just don't have that same level of self awareness right? right it takes them a while to kind of figure out or a lot of coaching or a lot of conversations for them to get their heads around like, oh, maybe I shouldn't go try to do this because it's just not what I gravitate towards. So um, so I think that's that's awesome that you that you realize that and you landed where you are, but you bought the franchise. But when you buy the franchise, like now you've got this, like, this business operating system that you can go work with any business with. Mm -hmm. Why franchise? Like, why did you decide to, to buy a franchise and then focus on the franchise community as your kind of core customer base, your your TAM, your target addressable market? Yeah, so... Or total addressable market. I messed that up. So, um, first of all, thanks for the... That was kind words, man. That, that means a lot. I appreciate that. Um, so, my community, my relationships professionally are primarily within the franchise community. Yep. And... I had already been introduced to EOS through a franchise. So naturally I started to ask around and started to discover that a lot of franchises to one degree or another run on EOS. Yeah. So there was already sort of a, I wouldn't say critical mass, but there was awareness there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I didn't have to cross this massive chasm of awareness. Yeah. Um, I also started doing due diligence in, in the EOS community and interviewing other implementers and found out that there were a lot of implementers who were working with franchises, but in a very disconnected, unintentional way. And as you know, as well as anybody, franchising is a unique animal. Yeah. There's so yeah. many different stakeholders and different interests and aligning them all and getting everybody on the same page is, is it's like a, a, a high wire act. Yeah. Right? So all these, all these EOS implementers were struggling. Yeah to serve franchises as well. So I saw an opportunity to quickly ramp up my business. I saw an opportunity to carve out a niche for myself as a specialist, yeah. our good friend, Corey Q, right? Niche yeah, down, yeah. there's a 750 implementers now. There were around 400. We all are teaching the same essential set of tools. So I needed to create, wanted to create something that I could own, yeah. uh, a category that I could be king of, if you want to call it that. And then I saw the opportunity to create a community of interest in EOS where we shared best practices and experiences so we could do a better job collectively serving the franchise community. So yeah. for me, like even talking about it gives me goosebumps because it's like, eh, that's the most beautiful thing professionally that you could ask for. Everyone interests aligned, right? Yeah. My professional goals, serving my community of fellow implementers so they can succeed and doing a good job on behalf of our clients. 
like what more could you ask for professionally? Yeah, yeah. And that's just good work. Yeah, you know? yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So how did you go about, you know, you buy the franchise, you decide, hey, I'm really going to try to niche down in the franchise community and, and be more intentional about implementing this system in a way that's beneficial for the entire franchise, not just for the Zor or for the Z. You figure that out. How do you go about getting your first set of customers? Was that, you know, did you go back into Justin Mink sales guy, like picking the phone up, sending some emails? Uh, full hustle mode, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I bore down and, you know, picked up my, my Rolodex and started, you know, making every call and just having every conversation. Um, going to the IFA convention, yeah. right? And um, my brand was kind of Scorpion, right? Yeah. So had to, had to sort of re-educate my, my people around a new brand for me, yeah. which was, you know, took some time. But it's yeah. It's still not over with, by the way. I, people were coming <laughs> to me at Fran Jam last night, like, yeah, Justin Meek, I just saw him. And I was like, they were talking to me and I was like, yeah, you know, he doesn't work here anymore. <laughs> like he's still, he's doing his own thing like EOS. And they're like, Oh, I think maybe I heard that, but he's always Justin from Scorpion. I'm right. like, okay, I can live with that. Like, yeah, I, can, I don't, I don't mind mooching off your brand equity a I little can bit. Too, still man. For the I mean, of us. I, I, Scorpion was uh, instrumental in really helping, uh, you know, me create relationships and, and a personal brand because Scorpion was so committed, putting us in all the yeah, right places with yeah, the right audiences, right. And, and and really investing what it took to do that. So. Um, yeah, man, just every phone call, uh, every person I could possibly imagine dialing up. And, and, you know, even when I was in sales at Scorpion, my whole sort of, I create like a, a whirlwind of activity. Yeah. And just throughout that, like, just motion outcomes on the other side of that outcomes, good stuff. So yeah. it's like, I think a lot of people who excel at what they do, they have a hard time articulating how they do it, right? Because it's yeah. just kind of what sure. it's in, intrinsic. It's inherent in them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's hard for me to explain. I just put myself out there, try to add value in a very uh, thoughtful way without being salesy. Yeah. And people grab, the people who really want to work with you will gravitate towards you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So one of the things, you, one of the things that I kind of caught um, on to pretty quickly once you started getting some momentum. I don't think you, it was it was necessarily right when you started, but it, you had a handful of customers, and obviously we're connected on all social channels. But you know, professionally, spent a lot of time on LinkedIn. You started really doubling down on, you know, just just putting content out on LinkedIn. How did that kind of play into your marketing or your sales strategy for for EOS? Yeah, I mean, everybody I want to be in front of is on LinkedIn. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, for me, my audience is C-levels and founders. Yep. And entrepreneurs. So uh, I like to write. It's something I'm good at. Um, when we were at Scorpion, I wrote all these blogs. Uh, I and remember. For all yeah. these publications. Yeah. And so, and then I had this epiphany at my first IFA as an implementer a few years ago, three years ago. Um, was it San Diego? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just started really leaning into LinkedIn and all these people were coming up saying, oh, I see your posts all the time. Like, it's good stuff. Because I wasn't selling. I was just uh, writing really about my own journey. Yeah. And yeah. mindset and uh, growth mindset and neuroscience and some things that I had learned personally than how that sort of synthesized with my professional experience. Right. Um, and people seemed to appreciate it. And then what ended up happening, so that was an epiphany. I'm like, wow, this is really kind of keeping me in front of the right people yeah, in yeah. a soft value add way. Yep. Right? I don't have to call people. And then really the first couple of clients I, I, I signed called me up out of the blue and said, Hey, I, I saw your post today and I've been meaning to call you. And I'm like, okay. So yeah. I'm like all in yeah. on LinkedIn. And it's, it's, it's become a discipline and habits made me a better writer, more concise writer. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I, I'm all in on LinkedIn. There's a lot of people that could do a lot, myself included. Like, I just, I don't, I mean, I, I think it's a little, the excuse at least that I make for myself, right, is I, I do have a, a pretty big org that I lead. So, you know, I don't find a lot of time or make a lot of time to sit down and really ideate on themes or content to write on about. But you've clearly kind of developed a system. So what are some pointers for people that want to do more type, like that short form content on platforms like LinkedIn? How do you go about organizing that on a weekly basis? Are you just... Are you just doing it fly by the seat of your pants? Or do you kind of have a, a system or a process that you use? I got. I have a system. So look, um, giving away a little trade secret here. Okay. But I want people to get value out of this. And, and certainly people should leverage the tools available. So I, uh, I download, you can download all of your data on LinkedIn. Yep. 
and you get a bunch of CSV files. And in one of those files, it has a spreadsheet, a CSV file with rows of links to everyone, every post you've ever posted. Got it. So I did that. I trimmed it down to all the posts that I had been publishing since my time as an implementer. When I really got intentional about it, there were about 900. Okay. Went to Fiverr, hired somebody to p copy all that to Google Doc, and then created a custom GPT where I uploaded that and said, this is my voice, this is my tone, this is my content. And now I can, so I have a AI tool that writes as me, informed by thousands of words of content that I've written. Yeah. And anytime I have an idea, an inspiration, a quote, I just plug it in, it spits back out a post. And of course I don't copy and paste it because it's still not. Yeah, sure, sure. But it gives me enough of a yeah. seed yeah. where I can take that now and within five minutes, 10 minutes, I've got a really nice post. That's awesome. And then what I've done is, now I've got two and a half years, 900 posts. A lot of people, my, my follower base has grown exponentially. And even then about 10% of your followers and connections see your posts. So most people are not seeing your content. So I cycled that back through with a daily email. I call Mink in a Minute because yeah, they're yeah, short yeah. form. I'm on the list. So that all feeds itself. Yeah. So now it's just this like a machine. Yeah. Because when I exhaust that, then I'll have another 900 posts that sure. I can then cycle back through. So yeah. it's just like it feeds itself and it's made it really easy and um, a good way to just put myself out in a value add way where I'm not, you know, I'm not pitching or selling. Yeah, it's it. a great share too. I mean, that's, I, I, I don't think I've known anybody that's done it that way. Yeah. So. Very, very unique. Yeah, very cool. unique. That's awesome. So let's talk a little bit about getting in the nitty gritty of EOS. So um, again, I don't want to. I don't want to give away any any specific names you're not comfortable with. But I'd love for to hear some stories from you about you know your journey as an implementer. Mm -hmm. Like what's been a client that you know it was like swimmingly success. Everything was great. Maybe tell one that that uh, maybe had its bumps and bruises and challenges, but like, what's just, let's, let's hear some more stories. Yeah, I mean, there's been a, a lot of cool stories. Um, just Between Friends was a great story. Shannon Wilburn. You know what's funny? I, okay, this is a sidebar conversation, but I, I was, um, this was probably a year ago. I think it was last, not this past Christmas, but the Christmas before, around that time. I was having dinner in Dallas at the Henry mm -hmm. with some people. Um, I think some I think Scorpion, a bunch of uh, us went to dinner one night there and ran into Shannon mm -hmm. and she had been in town with a group of her, of her franchise team. And she was talking to me about that part of that meeting was with you as their implementer. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and she's great. She's, she's just best. awesome. She's the best. So I didn't mean to cut you off, but, but yeah, jump, jump in and tell yeah. us a little about so that. So Shannon, you know, company founder was the visionary CEO for 20 years and, um, we implemented EOS. I was their third implementer. The first two didn't work out for a couple different reasons. So they were they were running on EOS, and it was a fantastic ride, man. Um, Shannon sold the company to a franchisee, really successful multi-unit franchisee named Tracy Panas. Yeah. And, um, okay. EOS helped with that transition. They leveraged the tools to communicate to the system so that. Not only did they calm the system and make them feel safe, but they used to energize the system and get them excited. And the transition was really smooth. Um, and the company, like they had been at $34 million system-wide revenue for a number of years. And then in two years, I shot up to 50 million in system-wide revenue. Wow. And a bunch of engaged, happy, successful franchisees. And that team, um, just a joy to be in the room with. Just they're so cohesive. They work well together. They're honest. They they have candor with one another, and any kind of feedback is is interpreted as constructive. Nobody gets their egos in the way. Yeah. Nobody attaches their identity to ideas. It's a it's a joy to be with those guys. I just graduated them. Horsepower Brands is another phenomenal client. Josh Golnick. Yeah. You know, sold a monster tree. Uh, started this company. 2019, I now have seven or eight consumer franchise brands. And I train every one of their franchisees through their academy. And they've, we've created a whole framework so that the franchisor can leverage EOS as a means to support franchisees in their growth without requiring the franchisees to hire me directly or someone like me. Right. So, right. which is, I mean, the thesis of franchising is to go in business by yourself, not for yourself, not by yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 
so many franchises just miss out. There's a blind spot on the basics of here's how to run a good business. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Here's how to yeah. create a vision that people can buy into. Here's how to lead and manage and hire the right people in the right seats. Yeah, yeah. And so they create a common context and a shared language and set of tools that all the franchisees can speak together. And it's uh, we created this kind of new framework that hadn't existed before. That's been a lot of fun. Got it. So again, I, I know I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a, a very simple question that I know is not a simple answer. Okay. Um, but to the extent that you can, you know what what are what are a couple of you know two or three things that you know, maybe businesses that are not operating as efficiently or effectively as they could be that would benefit from a system like EOS, but maybe aren't in a position or they have not pulled the trigger on. What are, what are a couple of things they should be looking at specifically to kind of lead them to say, well, maybe, maybe these things exist in my business, so I should go look for a system like EOS to yeah. help solve them? It's a good question. There's so many different reasons why companies run EOS, whether it's they're in some kind of pain whether, way they're, whether they want to make themselves more attractive to a potential suitor or prepare for an exit or transition plan, or even just a leader who is, you know, got into the business to have agency over their destiny and ends up being totally in control by the business, right? Yeah, so yeah. it kind of flips the whole purpose of being an entrepreneur on its head. So it's hard to generalize about the whys, but, but there's always some elements where entrepreneurs and high performing a players can like the very things that contribute to what makes them successful can also bite you in the ass right um, highly competent um, a high level of control um, sees and gets things that others can't yeah or don't and so a lot of leaders don't really have true leadership teams that can be autonomous and independent and really own and control their department and be accountable for their function yeah and what ends up happening is the head leader kind of just gets stuck having the, the business lives in their head. And they have a bunch of people who haven't, for whatever reason, aren't qualified or just don't feel the freedom and independence to operate and you know, to really control their function. So uh, what EOS does is it creates this level playing field of accountability and almost like it's like a forcing function that, um, that really shines a light in every dark corner of the business and really galvanizes a team to come together, function as a true leadership team and helps real leaders ultimately delegate and elevate so that they can get out of the way in a certain, to a certain degree. Yeah. And also free themselves up so that they can operate in their zone of genius, contributing at their best and highest capacity and really keeping their cup full because you can't pour out of an empty cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I've seen with a lot of leaders who implement EOS initially do it because we want to create a smarter company, more efficient, right? better strategy, more better processes, better communication. But what ends up happening is like a byproduct is they experience a personal sense of freedom and the business blossoms as a result. So like that sort of surprise and delight aspect of an implementation that some leaders don't bargain for, but like it's, it's wonderful to see it when that happens. Cause yeah. you can see the sense of lightness that, that leaders like, when they really come into their own and realize, oh, shit, this is more than what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Personally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's nice to see. What's it? What's a typical implementation or or engagement like from like a timeline perspective? What types of things are you taking them through? What's that process like? Yeah. Um, it's a little different for the franchisee training model, but but a typical working with the leadership team. The it's hard to say. Every company's unique, right? Um, so they're all operating based on their own timeline, but yeah. 10 full day sessions over a two year duration, at which point a client should be in a position where I can graduate them and they just don't need me anymore, right? They're, they live, eat and breathe it. Um, the first exercise, the first three sessions are typically within the first couple of months and they're foundational, setting up some of the foundational tools and creating the vision of the company. Um, the very first exercise we do is building the accountability chart, which is like ripping the bandaid off. Yeah, you've told me some stories. Yeah. <laughs> um, not many, but you've, you've told me some stories um, about that particular process. Mm -hmm. So what, what, are you, what are you comfortable talking about there? I know we probably don't want to divulge names in this, but like, yeah, what's that process like? Give give us a hint. Uh, give us kind of a glimpse into that accountability process. Without naming names, I'll give you the okay the yeah. framework. Yeah, 
So most companies have org charts and most companies build their org charts with the, they take the faces they have and they put them into a reporting hierarchy with the titles. Yep. And that's the org chart. Yep. So we kind of take a different approach to that. When I do this exercise, building the accountability chart with my clients, the mindset that I ask everyone to adapt as we go into the, the, the exercise is that you're all fired. Remove your ego, remove your title. You're on the board of directors. You're looking from the outside in. What is the right structure for the organization? Remove faces from functions to create simplicity, accountability, and clarity about who does what, who's responsible for what, and where one function stops and another starts. So we create an accountability chart where we remove titles because our thesis is that titles, maybe they're good for the outside world to understand what people do, but yeah. internally, titles create ego, they create self-interest, yeah. politics. So all we care about is what each seat in the business is responsible for doing. Yeah, And we build out the functions, the seats, and then what are the five roles or responsibilities or accountabilities for each seat? Because every org chart, you just see titles. Yeah. So now we have, when we ultimately net out this document, all the seats, now the whole company sees exactly what each department and seat holder is responsible for, what they do in the business with crystal clear clarity. Um, and only when we've created a chart with the visionary and integrator, which is a whole nother ball of wax, okay. plus all the functional heads, only when we agreed upon those, then do we fill in the seats with using another criteria around finding the right people for the right seats. Got it. So the stories from that are a lot of times leaders who have been maybe owners or they've been leaders for a long time, maybe they're an OG, so they just kind of by attrition or by longevity are leaders. Uh, Get maybe, exposed? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so there's a lot of pain in, in that process at times. There's a lot of uncomfortable conversations. There's a lot of sacred cows that are get addressed or elephants in the room. And it can be a pretty uh, traumatic <laughs> experience. But 99 times out of 100, that, it's like ripping the Band-Aid off three months later. Yeah, because that unlocks everything else downstream that you're trying to unlock. You yeah. got it. Yeah. And, and more often than not, if a leader loses their seat... When they get past the ego bruise, they're usually in a better place where they're happier and they can yeah. they can they can express themselves more fully because they're not in a seat that's just purely occupied based on ego and seniority. How does that? How often does that happen? A lot. Really? A lot. Like wow. I, I had one session where uh, a woman, she was one of the early early company employees, and she was kind of a leader just being around for a while. Yeah. She lost her seat, and. Uh, a three hour exercise took seven hours because she was crying and the team was essentially circling back to try to placate her for the next four hours until finally they all had the courage to make the decision that was right for the company. And she lost her seat on the leadership. Doesn't mean that she's not valuable. Doesn't yeah, mean course. that her contributions aren't important. Yeah, yeah, Just yeah. Means she's not appropriate to be a leader of a department. In yeah. fact, that department really shouldn't even exist as a function. And so she wouldn't go to dinner with the team. She was really upset. Three months later, she and I talk and she's like, that's the best thing that happened. Wow. Because now I didn't want to do that. Like now I'm doing what I love to do and what I'm good at doing. Yeah. And uh, I'm happier in my job and the company is, is running more smoothly because they're, they're not like this thorn in the company that everyone's trying to work around and not touch. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, look, those are, uh, we've, we've done similar type of strategy sessions at Scorpion through, um, we, we worked with, the table group. Yeah. Um, yeah. Patrick, Pat Lichetti, yeah, yeah. 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 Great stuff. Some of those conversations though, man, they're, they're, they're very difficult. Um, yeah. And, and you're right. I mean, it doesn't matter. I like to think like our, our leadership team at Scorpion, especially where we are today, um, like not very ego driven. Like it's, it's, you know, pretty much like everybody's there, but I mean, at the end of the day, like I've been here a long time. It's like, well, this is my job. This is what I do. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, and breaking down those barriers and like really asking yourselves the question, okay, just because it is doesn't mean is what's best. Yeah. Um, that's 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 tough. It man. takes courage for leaders and a real um vulnerability. So how do you what's your role in that process, right? Because it's you gotta strike a balance because you you know that this is a necessary part of the exercise like all the stuff that comes the positivity that comes down later has to has to originate from from this exercise mm -hmm. 
Like, what is your role in that though? Are you, you know, just kind of leading them? And then once they're kind of in it, you just sit back and you're watching or are you mediating or like, how, how are you functioning in that part of the process? In that capacity, I'm, I'm a facilitator and a coach. So I'm, I'm there to facilitate them to conclusion, right? I'm not telling them what to do. Yeah. But what I am doing is shining a light, holding the mirror up and creating an environment where they're in a way forced to confront it. Yeah. And work yeah. through it and right. not run from it or 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 what most companies do, which is push it down and try to ignore it. And then it metastasizes and takes root, becomes a way bigger systemic issue. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm digging, I'm unearthing, excavating that stuff and bringing it up and forcing them to deal with it. And then I'm coaching them to performance, right? Like, yeah, it's tough. I know this is painful. Come on, guys. Like, Let's uh, let's not shy away. Let's like let's go there. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's my. The good news is, I come in as a third party. If a if a if a client doesn't like what I have to say, fire me. I don't give a. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I say that from a good place, right? Because no, every other leader has to be politically aware. Yeah. Of what if they say something, they could get fired and lose their livelihood. Well, not only that, I mean, like, why hire you, right? If if you're not if they're not going to give you the freedom to like actually do and facilitate the thing that the very thing that they hired you for, right? So I, that totally makes sense. And for me, I'm a people pleaser by nature. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I've been in sales my whole career. Yeah. Yeah. Which, if you're a good salesperson, you 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 know how to speak truth and clients value that. Um, but for me, it's been a, a lot of development personally where I realized in the room that uh, I have a colleague who said, every session, say something that could get you fired. And when I started to really just be forceful and like, guys, come on, those are some bull rocks. You can do better, do better. Yeah. Like, that's when the complexion in that room changed, the trust with my clients deepened, yeah. the value that I was giving them deepened. Cause that, you're right, that's what they're paying me to do. Like yeah. somebody to come in and turn the tables over. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you find it ever situ in situations though? Cause I mean, at the end of the day, I would imagine like the, the person that ends up kind of writing the check, making the decision, Hey, we're going to go down this path. We're going to implement EOS. And we've chosen Justin me cause our implementer, like that's usually the CEO I would imagine. Most Typically cases. Typically CEO or founder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So do you find yourselves though, ever at odds with them in the room where Maybe, you know, they are part of the opportunity for improvement. And, but you know, they're writing the check. So better not piss that guy or gal off too much because otherwise they may kick me out. Like, how do you deal with, again, like you gotta be, you gotta hold truth. And sometimes that truth may be, you know, counter to what they think it is. So, yeah. Well, and that's a good point because uh, it's impossible for anyone to be fully self-aware. And a yeah. lot of CEOs are the least self-aware because nobody's telling them the truth. Yeah. And they have a lot of people, they're surrounded by people that are telling them what they think they want to hear. So EOS, when it's done the right way, like everything gets exposed. And I don't dance around it because again, if, if, if the CEO or founder can't take that, don't, it's okay. Like yeah. we'll be friends and I'll be fine because I've got other clients. Like yeah. I, you know, the VP of whatever might not feel comfortable telling that truth because they could get fired and their whole the livelihood. Yeah. I sure. lose one client, I got plenty of others. Right, right. 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 So I know I'm not I I I consider it my job to telling someone the truth is more important than protecting my discomfort. Yeah. Like my discomfort takes second seat to like my duty and responsibility to deliver the truth. Yeah. And yeah. if I can't do that, I'm I'm doing a disservice to my client. And I have no business being in this business. Yeah, well, that's a good. I mean, it's a good way to think about it. It's a good way to think about it's it. It's not easy to do that. It's taken me. It took me a while to get. Sure. I'm still not great at it. Sometimes. I mean, there's situations where I say to myself, I should have really just gone for the jugular, you know, and just. Yeah. But I don't because yeah, for but whatever you're reason. human too, right? Yeah. I mean, you understand like what's at odds. You understand what's at stake. I mean, like you said a minute ago. I mean, you've got people in the room that you know, may go through this exercise and unfortunately may come out on the other side and not be in the position that they are, they are in going into the exercise. And that's real impact to their lives and their families. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a difficult position to put yourself and in. And you don't want to so. lose somebody. It's a delicate balancing act because you push too hard, even if it's the truth and you can lose somebody. 
Yeah. So you want to make sure you are keeping them with you and sometimes engaged in the process. Trust, right. yeah. not feeling like they're blindsided or sucker punched. Yeah, right, right. So you've got to kind of massage sometimes and like gently walk someone down a path. And other times you can hit someone square in the gut and yeah. they can take it. Right? Yeah. Or it's appropriate. So it's it's a it's an art and a science. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of these people that are hiring you though, they know your background. Right. They know you've got sales experience. They know you've been in marketing and specifically in digital marketing for a really long time. They probably think you've got good perspectives there and you do. So like how often are they pulling you over to the side and going, Hey man, can you help us out with some marketing stuff too? Yeah, yeah, can happens. you help us with sell stuff too? <laughs> it does happen. That's the irony of 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 uh, doing what I do, um, because a lot of people hire or are interested in working with me or any implementer because they have a background in a certain vertical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we have to be really careful about crossing that line because the moment that I give an opinion and I become a consultant and not a coach, yeah, is the moment that. I open up a can of worms that could get me in trouble. Sure, right? sure. Didn't work, Justin. You told us to do this thing. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes I can't bite my tongue, right? Like, <laughs> I just like I know that about you. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And, I'll, and I'll say, guys, I'm taking off my implementer hat. I'm stepping over into my marketing hat. Okay. Have you thought about this? Yeah. Have you considered this? Um, just to stir the pot a little, and then yeah. I'll then I'll quickly back out. Just I want to plant the seed. Yeah. But you do have to be careful because I'm not there to tell anybody what to do. No. I'm just there to get them to come to a conclusion that's in the best interest. Well, that's of, again, that's good. That's good self awareness of you, man. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so so how are you thinking about or are you thinking about scaling this business, right? Because again, you talked about earlier. Hey, you're fully comfortable. You're enjoying being a solopreneur. You certainly don't want to go back and work for somebody else. You don't want to get find yourself in a situation where you're managing big teams. Right. But how do you think about scaling and growing this business? And I know like you're, you know, you got a married, you're married, you got a son. I know that's highly, highly important to you. But as it relates, I also know that you're very, you've always been a very driven guy. Like, you know, you, you, you're, you don't like sitting still. Like you want to be busy. You want to be working. So how do you, how do you think about, you know, business and scale and all that stuff? Yeah, it's, it's a, probably the trickiest thing in this business is to scale it. Cause it is very much a lifestyle business. You show up, it's like being an attorney. You, you put the hours in, you build the hours. And there's yeah. very little you can do to scale it. For me, some of the franchise one-to-many frameworks, that's yeah. a way to scale it. Um, creating a, I, I am becoming now, thanks to um, just all the intention and effort put into the franchise space, kind of like the go-to guy in franchising yeah. to go to. So uh, I have a referral network uh, that I can push business out when people want to work. To, with the local implementer. They don't want to travel to Dallas or do it virtually. And yeah. I don't want to travel to them. I can refer them to another implementer. There's some uh, revenue share that we do from, from yeah. referrals. So that's a kind of a way to scale it. Ultimately, and executive coaching is something I'm layering in. I really want to help because I've gone through a lot of suffering in my journey and with chronic illness and learning how to uh, still maintain a level of performance while uh, creating conditions to heal and be healthy. Yeah. And so I know there are a lot of other performers in this world that, um, that have struggles, whether yeah. it's physical or psychological or mental or emotional or spiritual. Yeah. And everything that they've always done, the only way they know how to respond and react is to go harder. And I've certainly been there. Yeah. And I've learned the hard way that you can, that doesn't have to be the way. So I want to help other performers and individuals learn how to let go of the things that don't serve them, keep the things that add value and really live an authentic life where they can perform exactly, they can be the master of the universe they want to be and still have a sense of authenticity and balance yeah. and fulfillment uh, in their lives. So coaching individuals, it's again, it's not really scalable, but ultimately who knows, man, all this writing I've been doing on LinkedIn and blogs, maybe that I'll someday look at it all and start thinking about how to create a course, yep. write a book. I don't know, man. Right now, I'm just so focused on on coaching EOS that right now I'm not worried about anything outside of that that you know aperture of focus. Yeah. Right? Everything else will fall into line down the road. Yeah, yeah. So, last couple of questions. Um, you know, you mentioned 
Um, and I've known you for a long time. We've talked about that, but you mentioned just some of the health tr- problems that you've had. You've you've tried a bunch of different things. Like it seems like knowing you the last couple of years specifically, I feel like you're in a really probably the healthiest you've been in a long time. Yeah. What what what's changed? Like how are you? What's your routine? Like what are you doing? What's what's working for you in that capacity that would be beneficial for maybe other people that are struggling there? Yeah, I mean it was a real. So pain is the great teacher and the great motivator. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and I've suffered <laughs> more than I can even believe I've suffered. Um, I mean, I lived in the state of, I mean, several years, probably every day, some, somewhere between a seven to 10 degree pain level, mm. lost tons of weight. Yeah. Yeah. Spent weeks at clinics and I mean, you know, some of it, but the modalities and therapies and time and suffering is just off astronomical. And for me, it was really just less about like a practice and more about a mindset because like we were talking about a minute ago, when I got sick, the only way I knew how to tackle that when Western medicine failed me was to go hard. Yeah. And every single bet that I made was like putting 10,000 in cash on the table. And when I lost, I was devastated. And so the only way that I could finally really start healing was to take a more curious, relaxed approach to healing versus uh, intensity. Yeah. Because the intensity is what got me in trouble in the per- first place. So my, my way of existing is to go hard over index, burn out, and then have to crawl into a hole for a week to recover. And, I, and so for me, it was just about how do I walk a middle path, which I still struggle with to a degree, but I've gotten a lot better yeah. at creating a lifestyle and a set of habits and disciplines that kind of keep me yeah. walking that, that center path. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. So today you're working with um, horsepower brands, you're working with propelled brands, mm-hmm. You just graduated just between friends, it sounds like, not too long ago. Yep. Um, so you've got some, I mean, these are great brands, right? So you're doing great work, fantastic work. How do people get in touch with it if they're interested in, in having a conversation about how you can help them? Yeah, uh, look me up on LinkedIn. Just search for Justin Mink. I'm all over LinkedIn every day. And uh, justinmink.com. Yep. Is, you can sign up for my daily email newsletter. I know it sounds like a lot, but it's called Mink in a Minute. So it's little- It's di- short. It's yeah. bite-sized yeah. chunks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's all value. I'm not pitching or selling anything. It's just mindset, tips, tactics, leadership, thoughts. Um, and you can go to eosworldwide.com forward slash Justin Dash Mink. That's my EOS site. Cool, cool. Anything else you want to cover today? Talk no, about? man. I, I'm, hey, I'm happy to be here. Um, it's awesome that you and I have been able to have this friendship for almost yeah, 20 years. It's crazy. Um, you know, when I think of... Uh, one thing I admired about you, you gave me a little, a little, uh, you threw a little smoke my way. So I got to give you some, <laughs> some return love. And for those listening, Jamie's one of the most like measured leaders who, one thing I've admired maybe most about you is like, you know how to say no, you know exactly what you are, you need to do and you remove all external distractions and stay laser focused on the mission. And saying no is as, if not more important than what you say yes to. And so one thing I've always admired about Jamie is, uh, is how often you say no, or just straight up ignore all the bullshit so you can focus on what truly matters. And that that is a hallmark of a great leader. I appreciate that, yeah. man. I appreciate yeah. that. Well, I too am thankful. I, I, it does, I, I want to say 17 years, because 20 just sounds like I, we're like <laughs> really older. aging ourselves right. and I don't really, I'm not ready to do that. Right. But but the sentiment is is certainly the same, man. It's been it's been a pleasure just watching you professionally and personally grow the way that you have, man. And love love the fact that I still get to work with you because we share a bunch of the same customers and we still share war stories and and we live in Dallas together. Yeah. So, man, thanks for thanks for just stopping by today. We're at IFA for all those on uh, watching this. We've got a little series going on, and uh, man, it's it's great seeing you again. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right, bud. Appreciate it. Yep. Yeah.